Okay, I'll just start. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much for coming to the AI seminar of the week. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have those external presenters this time. I'm going to present. Okay, so this is the first time that I talk about embodied AI in the seminar. So I will start from some understanding of like embodied AI, and then I will uh, focus on a specific type of problem, which is learning to object, uh, well, <clears throat> learning to manipulate objects. So let me start from what is embodied AI and why I'm interested in embodied AI. So at my PhD time, I worked on computer vision, okay, for like all the vision problems. I recognize what is like the, the person, the desk, or the chair, right, in the room. But then someday I start to think, okay, we design networks and we try to build data sets to push the performance, but would 70% be good enough or 90% or 99%? And why I'm recognizing this set of concepts, but not the other sets. <clears throat> okay, so after certain speculation, I come to the conclusion that um, this kind of question cannot well, the answer to this kind of question cannot be found within computer vision. I mean, have to think broader. <clears throat> okay. Okay, how do we think broader? Now, let me uh, start from example. So this is the honeybee, the speaking honey. Okay. <clears throat> and um, the picture here is what the evening primrose look like in our human's eyes. Okay, that's the yellow flower. Whereas for honeybees, they actually see the flower quite differently. So using UV, of like um, <clears throat> the, 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 the image, and then it's actually more resembles what the honeybee perceives it. It's using compound eye, so it's not exactly seeing the, the, the thing, but you can see that, um, well, it identifies the petal easily. As an example that, the vision system of the honeybee is formed by its function. Okay. A second example is the soccer. Like uh, professional soccer players are very good at controlling the flight curve of the ball. They know which part of the ball should be kicked by which part of the feet, even under like certain kind of air condition, like like airflow, or like uh, uh, for arbitrary kind of curves. <laughs> Or oh, not, I can't say arbitrary, but there are some, you know, very impressive curves. Okay, so this is achieved by keep on trial and error. It's like playing for many, many times. Okay, so that's our evidence is that um, the perception, cognition, the action, they are intimately coupled and form a close loop. Okay, so in psychology, there is the embodied intelligence hypothesis. Okay. In bottom hypothesis, the in intelligence emerges in the interaction of agent with the environment and the result of the sensory motor activity. So um, in my view, embodied AI actually means building the closed loop learning framework and pushes the emergence of intelligence in this closed loop learning framework. So there's a topic about how to do perception and how to build the world model and how to act based upon the perception and the world model. And then there's a part that you interact with change the state of the world and then get knowledge and even update your perception system. Okay. Um, in all the previous examples, um, we see that uh, there are certain kind of like manipulation of objects. Even for the example of picking the honey bee, well, the kind of you picking the honey and the example of like um, using the feet to control the flight of the ball. Okay, that's a kind of a manipulation. Okay. Um, well, a lot of people nowadays share the same pattern with us to push in the body of AI. And there are actually a lot of concurrent works. Okay, so next let me review some of the efforts, especially I'll start from the part of the data. Because embodied AI in nature includes interaction data, and therefore collecting such kind of interaction data is critical if we're going to adopt a data-driven approach. Okay, so let me quickly reveal some of the data driven, sorry, the embodied AI environment. Now, while you could, of course, build the real world environment, like training the cars about hunter driving or like building the armed farms. Whereas usually it's quite costly and the cost 
actually is not only in hardware, it also includes like the human, human labor. And that's pretty dangerous. And the other alternative option is like uh, to consider to collect data in a simulator. And this will give you a scalable and reproducible way of putting the result. And plus, it's safe. Now, let me show you some of the popular embodied AI setups or environments. So this is um, the AI hacker environment. Actually, it's a demo from a student Jia Yun Gu's internship work at Meta AI um, this summer, or the start of the last summer. You can see that there is the mobile agent that's able to open a cabinet or open a refrigerator and pick something and, and move it to the table. And it's really impressive in achieving the complex tasks. Okay, and all of this uh, is actually in a closed loop um, uh, framework. And the second example is the I4, which is pushed by the Allen Institute for like high level planning. Now, the third example is the I Gibson or behavior data set pushed by the Stanford University. Okay, and you see that it's actually holding a knife and cuts the, the onion. So all these environments are amazing. And they have pushed the, the, the progress of the, of the community, okay? And especially, you know, like uh, they are good for high level planning. But if you look closer, there are certain things missing. And certain procedures are abstracted away. Like looking at the open drawer example, as a gripper is approaching the object or the drawer, there is certain magic grasp, okay? They're just attached, okay? And without, the interaction or detailed contact really happen. And for a second example, cracking the egg, you see that there's even not a, really a gripper, right? So egg moves autonomously and cracked itself. And the third example of the behavior um, <coughs> demo, which is actually their official uh, website demo, the, there should be a five finger to hold a knife, five finger hand to hold a knife, but you don't see actually they are holding it. And then as the knife is approaching the onion, it, just separate uh, by itself. So we see that the certain paths absolutely away. And these are the short horizon tasks. And in fact, they're pretty hard to solve. Okay, and we call the ability, the ability to solve such kind of short horizon tasks as the manipulation scales, which are kind of primitive in composing the very complex um, manipulation process. Okay, and largely this kind of a scales are missing for the current embodied AI research. Oh, if you really build the kind of robot you deploy in the real world, this, well, missing this components is, is an actual problem. And in my view, the manipulation scales is really, really important. They're kind of the, core, the cornerstone in embodied AI. It's kind of analogous to object recognition and computation. Like with the scales solved, you consider you might be able to push the deployment of, the, of, of the robots for like domestic service, for like human robot interaction, for like object rearrangement. And then this is kind of like, if you have a good object detector, then pushing in the direction of like image captioning or like QA or like scene classification will be much, much easier. Okay, so why people uh, um, start to work on high level thing? Well, just skipping the layer, I mean, the vision scales. One of the reason is, Obtaining good manipulation scales is really hard. Let's see what are the challenges. Okay, first of all, there could be imperfect sensing. Like here, um, the robot arm tries to open the door, and you see that there's handle. Now, without perceiving a handle, you can't really finish the task. Whereas in the process of accomplishing tasks, observe that a self occlusion is common. Okay, and then you must have a ability to like reason the whole manipulation procedure to complete this missing part caused by self occlusion And then manipulation would not really always be like perfect. There could be unexpected events, right? And so a good a scale should be able to recover from the errors. And then some of the tasks really impose very strict constraints. Like here, for the precision assembly, a small mistake in either the perception or like the actual, actual uh, well, the action, um, the action time will cause the failure of the task. And then, well, well, if we're pushing the kind of generic skills to be useful for our human life, as, as our humans, like in our daily life, like to manipulate all the objects in the room, that's hard, okay? Like here, I have a tissue, there's a softer body. Manipulating such kind of a, a piece of a, of a paper is, is hard. And we all know like plastic bags, this is a, such a common object, right? We use it every day, 
for all kinds of tasks, it's tricky. Like even for time, the links come here, it's hard. Okay. And not only like for achieving all kinds of scales, even for a certain kind of scale, like just to turn the faucet, um, well, you have to handle the large topology and structure uh, and the geometry variations of objects. Like just the faucet, there are so many different ways to open it. Okay. So object manipulation is just hard. How do we solve such kind of very hard problems? Um, well, a lot of effort needs to be done. And well, importantly, we do need to collaborate research across all the uh, units, research units in the world. Okay. So for effective evaluation and collaborative research, good data set is important. A good data set needs to actually support the measurement of the success rate in a reproducible manner and also easily accessible by any group in the world. Like in computer vision, uh, like in graphics, there are certain uh, prior works of, of, my, of me, like ImageNet or ShapeNet, they have significant uh, push the progress of the communities. And then nowadays, we actually aspire to build the simulation environments that will push you know, the progress of the embodied AI. So ideal cases, this will be the simulation environments with rich assets and tasks that would satisfy the following requirements, making it easy to reproduce experiments, and then making experiments low cost, I could dump the rich interaction information, which includes the primitive information about the interaction sequence, like action labels, or even the force feedback. Like, well, uh, important uh, well, requirements, um, is it needs to be realistic to verify useful numerical skills. Like for the previous three examples I show, uh, they are good, but they are not really able to push the de deployment of, of robots. And then there should support the fast research and development cycle, like the environment needs to be fast. So all this actually points to like, maybe at the moment, um, <coughs> simulation environment is just a critical, okay? And something that we cannot um, you know, get around. Okay, so next, I'm first going to introduce some of the simulation environment, like simulation environment uh, effort from a group in Manisco 2. And then I will introduce two algorithm efforts um, um, the Manisco. Okay. Now, the first, uh, the Manisco 2. So, Manisco 2 is actually a benchmark for object manipulation scales. Uh, it includes like uh, scales from 20 task families, including over 2,000 objects. And it's actually pretty uh, well. We have strong software implementation that at each GPU, we're able to support the visual policy collection at over 2,000 frames per second. And we have uh, curated four million demos <coughs> for those methods like imitation learning or learning from scratch. As we see, that is actually an interactive environment uh, which provides a unified interface um, and evaluation protocol. So there is like a, a train test. Split and for all kinds of tasks, there's a unified API for vision or machine learning researchers to use it. And it actually could support uh, the benchmarking of many kinds of algorithms, like the classical sense of planet acts or like the modern reinforcement learning and imitation learning paradigms. So there are many features of it. Now, first of all, <clears throat> as I mentioned, it actually supports a lot of tasks. And in fact, we push the many, many, many scale to support many kinds of different, you know, you know like uh, <clears throat> challenges. To address many kind of challenges in, in manipulation um, study. Like it supports rigid body, simulation, articulate body manipulation, subtle body, or fluid manipulation. And it supports like single arm or dual arm. Like the grippers include the parallel gripper or specialized lens factor. And then, while well, we support mobile manipulation, which means that um, in, in interaction, well, in, in a procedure interaction, the robot could move or stationary manipulation, which means like the arm is mounted on the desk. The second is that we provide a lot of utilities to some point of research. Okay, so for machine learning or vision researchers, certainly you're interested in the part that um, like perception question or like you know uh, the, the, the how, how do you build it so good. But there are a lot of factors that are pretty important and you can't ignore if you want your algorithm to work well. Okay, so we try to build a lot of utilities to help you simplify um, and speed up research. For example, uh, we observe. Different tasks could be better solved with different kinds of uh, controllers. You know, like in the interaction um, learning problems, there's one question that's called like the choice or design of the action space. Okay. For example, 
if we're talking about like picking up objects, now the good action space would be the ending factor position and the pose. Okay. Whereas if you're considering like collision, uh, when you are trying to move the arm in space, and then you have to control the joint, the angles of every joint. Okay, the joint space, action space, the controller is, is, is necessary. Okay, so of course, um, for vision of machine learning researchers, probably you think that it's kind of like very low life thing, and you want to just use the best one, but you don't want to make too much efforts in, you know, like uh, <clears throat> um, um, converting them. And therefore, we do provide like a, a few controllers and the functions to help you convert the action space of a demonstration to a desired one. Okay, later I'll present the research that shows you the importance of considering like the um, you know, like uh, the, the the space um, to represent the action or the state, the input. Okay. And third is uh, Manusu is actually a powerful system. Uh, it's very fast in terms of running. Um, like especially is designed for fast visual policy learning, like visual RL or visual vision learning. Now, with for reading the body, we have a very advanced render system that allows very fast sample collection. Like for F, for for just a one on 2080 kind of GPU, you're able to collect samples at a rate of over 2,000 frames per second. What does that mean? If you compare with the VR, you can maybe like the, 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 the um, ISAC here or the C or the AI Habitat, we see that um, we actually have a much faster system if you consider visual policy learning. Okay. Okay. So here is like, like the asynchronized render server. So the key idea is to minimize the, the, the idle time for the CPU and the GPU. Now with, with some careful software engineering, this is the cheap one. Okay, to give you a better and concrete sense, let me show you some example tasks and use case. Now the first is a software body manipulation task. Now you want to pull the water out of the bottle to a beaker to reach a specified water line. Uh, for this task, um, <clears throat> we will need to represent the input. For example, because there's soft body involved, you may consider to represent the scene as a point cloud, okay? Like then the water is like a thought as a collection of particles. Now you could try to do imitation learning um, from a lot of demos. What we find out, because the position of the cup and the water level set is randomized, the simple imitation learning from point cloud will not really work. Whereas if you will, also include, like if you detect the water level and the position of the beaker and include it at, as input, as a state, then you are able to do the imitation learning correctly. Okay, so this very simple example is trying to, to show you that um, for generalizable policy learning, the imitation learning scheme actually has serious issues in, rec in recognizing the task, okay? Okay, <clears throat> so, or, or like uh, inferring implicit constraints in a task. And the second example is the turn faucet example. And I mentioned that turn faucet is actually not a simple thing, right? This is the first example, one type of a gesture. The second example, it's a very different kind of uh, strategy to turn on the faucet. And the third, yet another very different strategy to turn on the faucet. You see that, um, in fact, um, by our experiments, the existing reinforced learning algorithms are pretty hard in really solving the tasks. Okay. Now there's a third example. That's a task that requires the collaboration of two arms. Like for example, pushing this swivel chair to a target position specified by the red block. And more, what's making the problem more, more difficult is that it's under active system. Now in control theory, this means that the dimension of the control signal is lower than the degree of freedom of the whole system. And therefore, um, well, and also for the problem, you know, building an explicit model of it is very hard. And therefore, it's very tricky to use like a, a model-based approach, you know, like the classical model-based approach to solve it, like design or use the mass to derive some certain kind of controller. And the machine learning is very important. Okay, and there's a second example that we have a sphere that's actually inside the bucket. You don't see it. The sphere is moving and also making the system under it. 
Okay, we actually did a lot of efforts to make the simulation better. And there's the full technical stack from that still. You see that at the very bottom level is the low level resources, like the public libraries, uh, many are from NVIDIA, and some are from my previous work, like ShapeNet. And on top of it, there's a level of simulation engine as the SAS, like the, 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 the partner mobility data set derived from the ShapeNet. And then there are a number of like a renderer and a well, simulator um, things. Okay, written by my students. On top of this is space of tasks. And we need to design like the reward, like uh, the specification of tasks, like the examples. That's the level of uh, many skill too. And on top of it, there'll be the set of utilities, like the motion planner, um, the, the controller, converter. Okay, and also there is the machine learning library, RL or IL or, or like mo model pre control. We hope that uh, we provide a complete set of tools and help researchers to quickly enter the field of embodied AI without much, you know, like struggle. And in fact, um, this is quite a big thing. And my group pushed this direction with a lot of efforts, which is not simply a set, well, putting together the, 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 the libraries on the market or uh, from GitHub. For example, um, one question is for rigid body simulation, Okay, you want it to be fast, and usually people have to do canvas decomposition first. Okay, and the approaching canvas decomposition is actually a tricky problem, although the exact canvas decomposition is a hard problem. Um, this is a, the C graph from 22 work from my students, and it's a software called the collision aware approaching canvas decomposition that's able to decompose shapes um, into canvas uh, pieces. But preserving its collision properties. Like looking at an example on the right, for this door opening task with our co ACD, the comest, after comest position, the hole is still preserved. And therefore, the, the, the robot is able to hold the gripper, well, the gripper is able to hold the handle. <laughs> Whereas this is a baseline of software package um, that we, we dragged from, from GitHub, um, then is actually fit in the hole, you see. So there are a lot of tricky issues in building the simulation. And there's another example. Now we want to minimize the, uh, the sensor going up between the simulation world and the real world. And we actually try to simulate the depth sensor in a many scale um, system. Okay, so I don't put much time on it. But that was basically the efforts that we made. But in building a suite of tasks for evaluating um, and learning the manipulation skills. And that's let me uh, put more time in explaining two technical work. Okay. The first is a scalable policy learning or GSL. Our goal is actually to learn a policy that has generalizability over many kinds of uh, you know, like classes and many kinds of uh, variations of objects of a certain task. Okay. For example, we want to have a policy that's able to open any kind of drawer of any kind of cabinet. Okay, to be able to open like the, the, the door on um, any kind of, uh, um, I don't know, like a well, um, <laughs> um, container. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are not really uh, familiar with reinforcement learning, let me give you a high level <laughs> um, idea of reinforcement learning um, by draw a certain analogy to search algorithm. I hope that. Uh, you're all kind of familiar with the search algorithm like A star. Okay. So you could think of RL as a kind of search algorithm like A star. But A star try to enumerate the possible actions. Whereas for reinforcement learning, it has a policy network to guide the search. And then or evaluation or enumeration of that. And then in A star, there is a heuristic function that helps you to prioritize the state to search. Now, whereas in RL, you have that network in place of a heuristic function. And in search algorithms, you, you, you basically think that it's like you're trying to search for a certain kind of a path and a graph, right? And then when you move, you got to wait. For RL, when you take an action, you actually get a certain rewards. Okay. So basically, you can draw a very close analogy between RL or um, deep RL on the search algorithms is largely a combination of, of solving two problems. One is optimization problem. Okay, so you try to find 
the strategy or policy to maximize the cumulative reward. And the other is because you have introduced certain networks, like the policy network and value network, um, you will be able to achieve certain kind of generalization. Okay, especially for our purpose to achieve like multitask deferral, you can think of the uh, design of the neural architecture like this. Okay, you basically will have a state of uh, which is describing the environment, and then you will have certain kind of task encoding. But sometimes this kind of task encoding is implicit. It's like just from the state, you're able to infer the constraint of task. Like think of the water pouring example, right? You have the you have a scene, there's a bottle of water, and then there's a beaker with a line on it. And basically, you will infer the location of the beaker and the amount of water you would like to pour in by watching like the point cloud of the scene. So this is a, this dash arrow line, basically that you will be able to like, infer task implicitly from state. And then you have state and you have task encoding, and it will be passed through the policy network to generate a like to generate an action or sample a certain action or a value network to assess how good the state is for the task. Okay, so this is the basic impression of multitask deferral. And why achieving multitask deferral is hard? Because you want to address the optimization problem and the generalization problem simultaneously. Let me illustrate the idea more clearly using a, 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 a like a ideal experiment. Okay, so here is a very minimal example that tries to demonstrate the joint optimization and generalization is very difficult. So this is a four shaped maze. Okay. And you will start from the blue point to navigate in the space. And you are required to achieve one on star, which is the goal. And here the analogy is each goal is like a task. Okay. And then while you are moving, you will receive one, a positive reward, positive one, if the movement is approaching the goal. But if you are taking the wrong direction, you receive like negative one. Okay, that's the setup of the dense reward. Okay, okay so think of a two kind of strategies. One is you are going to train the RL in a generous way, which is like a, the most plain way when you're training neural networks. Think of like you're training a network for classing image that pictures, right? You will just sort of randomize all the images uh, and then or randomize the order of loading the images, right? Every time you form a batch, you form a batch. Now here for the general strength, it's like for every episode, every time you randomly generate, generate a task. This is like, you will randomly sample one of the stars every time, okay? And next time a different star or go is sampled, okay? And what do we observe is, this is actually very tricky to learn because at the very beginning, the, the agent is at a blue point. As long as it's moving backward, it will get a certain reward. And therefore, it's actually completely useless to recognize which goal is approaching. Basically, before um, arriving at this intersection point, you just notice, like, um, you just notice, like, uh, um, the, 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 the connectivity inside this small pattern. Okay. And therefore, in earlier stage, um, you just will see the network will ignore the presence of all these goals. Okay. And we call it as a phenomenon of a catastrophic ignorance. Like originally, for your input, there is the state and there is the class of coding, whereas the network just ignores the class of coding. Until it reaches here, when it continues to move, you actually have it, the agent actually has to be aware of the task that it needs to address. However, just in the early stage, the network just decides to ignore the state and coding. And after it reaches here, it's actually very difficult to relearn that there are certain parts of the input, the part of the, the task specification is useful for accomplishing it. Okay, so because of the catastrophic ignorance and the network is, is it's just a feeling hard to relearn um, the, the relevance between the goal and the, the task encoding, the general is it's very tricky, I mean, very slow to train uh, in the latter state. Then an the autonomous strategy is actually considered like special experience. Now the strategy is 
you will have a number of specialists, and every specialist just attempts to a specific type of task. In your implementation, that means for all episodes, the specialist will just solve the same. Of course, for the specialist, it will not really suffer from like the catastrophic ignorance problem, right? And it's much easier than that. Okay. Um, in terms of memorizing strategy for the network, it's much easier. However, obviously, a, a, a specialist kind of way will not be able to generalize across us. So this is the kind of observation we get. And then the question is, the previous, how could the previous observation inspire us to build a framework that will allow us to learn in large scale for reinforcement learning? Okay, so, so to summarize, generalist learning is very fast at the beginning, okay? Because a lot of kind of tasks, there will be certain kind of shared structures and you know, learning them in a shared manner is good. However, there will be worse asymptotic performance. Whereas for specialist training, it's slower at the beginning, but it will have better asymptotic performance. Also, the specialist training can be trivially parallelized. That's another advantage. So given the observation, we actually proposed such a scheme, which was accepted at SML 2022 with a very high score. <laughs> okay, so uh, the idea is actually to have such a kind of loop. At the beginning, there's a generalist that tries to solve all the tasks in a joint manner altogether. And you see that it will make certain progress. But the third stage, it will reach, uh, reach a certain amount of plateau. You know, when it, you, you observe the, the, the convergence and find that the plateau has been reached, you will start to fork the generalist for many copies, sharing the weights. And then you will also try to divide your task into many small groups. And then for each fork of the generalist, it will just be irresponsible for one or just a few number of tasks. Okay, so every specialist will learn independently by themselves. And after they almost solve the, the task or have solved the, the task, we will try to merge them or distill them into a single generalist with generalizability. Okay, the way for us to distill it is actually pretty simple. Just for every specialist to roll out in environments, and that will generate a lot of data. And this data is kind of like, well, in modern words, it's kind of like pertaining data, right? <laughs> then, you know, older words, it's like, you know, distillation kind of key. So you just will load your generators and try to use the demos thrown out by the specialists and do learning from demonstration to improve the original generalist. This will quickly push the generalist to do a good job. This is kind of like, okay, the, the, the professor, right? The professor will at the beginning teach the PG students or the grad students or your you know, undergrad students a lot of stuff. But at certain stage, okay, everyone does this independently. And then sometimes they will come back and teach the professor. Okay, so the, teach, the professor learns new knowledge and train the next generation of students. Okay, that's kind of a metaphor, um, similar to the human organization. Okay, let me show you the results. Now, first of all, on the left, this is result on the fourth main example, I guess you done study. It's actually to solve five tasks. And the blue part is actually the task, if you will, is a generalist train to all the joint train on all the lines. And you see that here, it will reach a certain time factor. Now, if you still train the generalist, it will cover three scores, which is the part that is created, and then that's the blue part. Okay, you see that? It, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Act like this is the number of samples you interact with the environment. Why this like the important information? If you see that, um, if you just use a single generalist with the blue curve, the solid and dash confidence is like the one uh, production. And then now if you introduce specialists for here, the red curve shows that um, the specialist is able to actually learn three parts, and the dress is that the seven parts. And here is that. Five tasks, for a simple task with a problem of five tasks, <laughs> multi-task people are already to solve. And then somehow the specialist after they cover or almost cover here is actually not really covered, it's almost covered, but they also need to research the classes for the specialist. You collect the demos from the, the specialist and do a kind of 
as a, a learning from fast transfer to retrain the grammars or, or find similar grammars. Okay, just doing like learning from translation, for example, with an argument from A to G. Okay, and you will be able in the end to achieve very high performance for the grammar. Um, um, well, that was just an experiment involved on the toy setup. Uh, in the real setup, which is a many skill environment, we had a task of a push chair. We, I think that we have like over, around uh, 50 task variations. Um, we can also use this kind of trick. You see, the many skill is much harder. If you just train one generalist, actually, it's, I don't know how long we have to wait until it's able, the single generalist is able to really solve. You know, many kind of variations of, of here. Whereas the general specialist training scheme, I just illustrate, illustrate it, actually is able to, to allow us to, you know, to solve uh, the task at a much better quality than the single generalist. Okay. So that's the, the idea of um, the generous specialist training. I personally feel like this is a pretty important discovery, um, motivated by the challenge of many skills. To achieve large scale and generalizable reinforced learning. So, at a high level, this is a matter of the for large scale R. So, basically, if you have a kind of reinforced learning algorithm, train specialist, and the kind of learning from that basic algorithm to merge the, 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 the specialist into the generalist, you're able to do well. Okay. So, like, if the divide hunter kind of strategy, the individual tasks can be solved well. Then we actually is able to solve them jointly. Okay. Um, you know, like um, it's also kind of an idea to decompose the challenge of optimization and generalization. And again, it's pretty easy to parallel on computing cloud. I think that it will be very useful to, to put the future, you know, work on like evolutionary um, um, methods. Okay, so that's kind of a, a framework for scalable policy learning. And in the end, I'm going to introduce a recent work from my group, a step in the core, which is uh, for pushing a 3D video on um, policy learning, a 3D R. Okay, now, first of all, uh, we are addressing object manipulation problems. Object manipulation problems is something that's happening in our 3D physical space. And the large portion of it is actually reason the relationships, especially spatial relationships between objects, including between a gripper and object. And you could think that intuitively and, and naively, right? The three direction feature should be able to, is more suitable than 2D image of input. And in fact, if we take certain kind of retrospection, and look at the development of the field, which is called the grass and post prediction. Now, back in 2016, we detect literature and post prediction. Most of them are like back map things. And nowadays, if you want to like check the literature for grass post prediction, basically, you don't see batch based approach. All methods are based upon the reasoning in a 3D latency, for example, point cloud for all methods. Okay, so like the contact graph snap is the latest, most effective one. So the history of grass post prediction will just uh, push us to think. Now, for manipulations research, will the trend be we should go from 2D visual RL, like RGB or database, to 3D visual RL, like point cloud or volumetric representation or other kind of a imitation based. Because perhaps in 3D, reasoning the spatial relationship is much better space. Now I'm going to use one work to, to show that this probably is true. Okay, we will still use Manuscale as the benchmark and the platform to train 3D reinforcement learning. Okay, because Manuscale, um, <laughs> such a simulation environment and put a lot of efforts in getting the sensory data good. Like here, um, this is the, well, here is the point cloud captured by the ecocentric um, <coughs> depth camera. 
It's a panoramic camera. And we're going to learn the policies using this kind of a like point cloud input. Okay. Oh, there should be an animation. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. There should. Okay. Okay. So think of the problem. Now suppose that you're going to have the point cloud as input for a policy learning. Let's say you need a policy network and a value network because your point cloud is input. Let's say you just use point net, the simplest um, option for the policy or value network. There's a question actually. Very often, um, it can work. Very simple. But there are a lot of experiments by us. The actual science is perhaps the most important trick to make sure the error works. That is, for point clouds, the first amount of thing is actually a collection of x, y coordinates. I mean, which coordinate frame would you write about this coordinate? Okay. So you probably think, okay, I could use world frame here, yeah? but then there are actually many other alternatives. That there could be the base frame, that there could be the end effect frame, that if you detect objects, there could, all be, could, could also be like object frame. Basically, there are a lot of frame choices. Are they equally effective or some are better than others? Well, our conclusion is, yes, they are hugely different, and in fact, from a lot of experiments, we find that we think that so far, this is perhaps the most useful trick to make 3D RL work. Okay. So let me first try to justify, <laughs> justify by, by some kind of reasoning um, that ND factor frame is a good frame for manipulation, let's say, taking that off. But ND factor frame, I mean, that you will have a frame installed at the ND factor. And the orientation of this ND factor frame is always aligned with the orientation of the ND factor. The frame, frame of the XYZ axis is always aligned with the orientation of the axis. And then here's the visualization, it will, will align the ND factor frame. Okay. Uh, somehow, we find that it's pretty interesting for like, Opening a cabinet or pick object, uh, many kinds of manipulation tasks. Knowing the relative position between the entity factor and the object under manipulation is the relative position, especially the distance between them, it's critical. It's critical. Like knowing the distance between any factor and object under manipulation is critical. Okay, this is just an important piece of information. Now, if you are using for example, the world frame to represent the point cloud. Now, reading the distance between any factor and the handle of the, the cabinet is that you basically need to localize two objects and compute the distance. On the, for the network, recognize them and try to memorize um, the action that you should take. On the other hand, if you're using the ND factor frame, now, the question of the relative post between the E, the ND factor, and the handle just become the post of handle problem. And computing the distance is extremely simple. So largely, you have reduced the binary relationship in inference to the single object localization problem. So that's why we actually constantly find that ND factor frame is a good frame if we are performing like um, <coughs> interaction when a, when a gripper and object is pretty close. Okay, so let me show you some of the experiment results um, on many scale tasks. Uh, basically, um, x axis is an uh, interactive step, and y is a uh, is, is reward, and each plot corresponds to a different kind of uh, um, manipulation scale. And we see that the blue curve and the green curve is constantly better. Here, the green curve is actually just an defective frame I introduced. And in fact, the blue curve is also good. The blue curve is like using the path to be manipulated um, as a reference, and you place a play in that. Okay. Now, what is bad? The, most, the worst choice is actually the world frame. The worst case is actually the world frame. We actually try to add a spatial transformer and see whether reinforcement learning is able to learn the proper transformation and compile, but that experiment is, is not very successful. So the RL gives pretty noisy supervision. And actually, the emergence of the correct frame for operating objects is not easy to learn. And then, 
for the robot base frame, it's better and the world frame. Somehow it's also helping us reason relative close between the gripper and the um and the object under manipulation better, but it's not as strong as an effective frame. Okay, so single frame comparison seems to confirm that uh, an effective frame is good at the frame. Whereas actually also have a lot of uh, dual arm manipulation. But for such kind of cases, a robot has two arms and two end effectors. And therefore, even you, if you know that you should choose the end effector frame, you have two choices, which one you choose. And plus, for our mobile manipulation class, because the face that the robot is moving, and you can, you can just speculate in the process when the robot is moving, right? You shouldn't worry about like the pulse of end effector so much. Okay. So there's a question, are we able to automatically combine multiple frames? In a way, that's good. Okay, and we actually propose a method it's called frame manner. We try to use a number of different kinds of schemes, like transformer-based approach, like uh, uh, mixture expert-based approach, like some kind of a feature fusing approaches, right? And try, and try to transform the point cloud in different frames, make decisions, in each of the frame and combine them, which is up adaptively assign a temporally varying, varying ways to the decision from different kind of frames along the manipulation process. And we find that uh, this kind of idea to adaptively choose the correct frame uh, uh, along with the manipulation process is the best strategy. If you look at the curves, we actually try three way to adaptly select the frame and there are two baselines. Now check all the curves, especially for some restricted parts like push chair and move cabinet, move bucket. This is the under accuracy stuff. You see that? They are also like the kind of task that has to be accomplished by two arms. You see that fusing the frames is highly effective. And just choosing one of the effective frame is not as effective. Okay. We actually also have certain kind of observation. Mm -hmm. so where is the end of this one? All right. This is a random one. Is there a difference? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay. So another um, um, discovery we found is for a mobile manipulation class, in fact, um, the large approach will favor different kind of frames along the whole process. Like in the very beginning stage, it's a robot which is approaching the chair, and the base frame actually is giving more weights. When it starts doing the manipulation, the gripper frame starts giving more weights. Okay, so that's the one work. Um, we try to push this to the URL direction using minus scale, a benchmark. Next, let me give you some example other works in my group. Okay, along the idea of pushing the perception and the interaction in closed loop. So here is a work uh, that we, 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 I mean, that is a basic model, it's an important for um, Nicholas to ask the question just now. Okay, so the idea is learn the latent world model. Of course, learn the latent world model um, is related with the perception model. Okay, especially for visual RL, you have to learn to predict how the world will be changed by your action. Okay, this is largely a, 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 a vision problem. Okay, largely a vision problem. But also for this work, it also combines like the global search represented by the temporal difference learning and the local search, which is like a model predict control in a large vision model. If you're interested, um, well, welcome to read the paper. And also Nicholas um, will be invited to give another talk. Okay. And then another uh, line of research, um, um, I, I, I mean, I want to emphasize here is soft body manipulation. So my student Zhao Huang has done a lot of great work on this line. Um, for example, well, it's actually using differentiable physics for policy learning. It's actually also related with the previous app of the model based on model learning. Because uh, you know um, <clears throat> the different fitness is essentially still uh, an effort on building a better model in the world. Okay. And for for Jill's work, 
he actually applied the exposed problem. For example, how do you discover contact points for motor state manipulation task? And also the, the question of, again, how to combine a global search and local search problem. And how do you combine policy gradient with a gradient descent? Okay. Okay, and then um, there are efforts in my group to push the computationally generated policy line. Okay, so other than the skill training task we saw at the very beginning, I, I mentioned that Jia Yuan had to work at the Meta, right? Basically, uh, she's a very complex task for opening the refrigerator, pick all these places, right? That's kind of a composition with that whole line. By having a good skill, we can compose. And then there are also the work from my group that emphasize the importance of objects centric repetition of the scene to achieve the compositional generative learning. Like for a complex, it's a unit for like um, allowing to reason the transition or the dynamics model or like the policy in terms of compositional manner. Like uh, for example, here, if you, you play the tech on here, now you try to learn in an environment with a few foot in the environment, but the policy will transfer to an environment with many more foot. Okay, so these are just some of the uh, 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 example of works. Um, I, I think my students have a lot more interesting works. Okay, if you're interested, check the group web page. So conclusions. Now, I give you a brief sense of my view for embodied AI, and also we see the importance of manipulation skills. Um, I, I have also shown the efforts from my group to build a benchmark for manipulation skills, and also we are pushing the task well. The, 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 towards the goal of building effective 3D reinforcement learning frameworks. Okay, so I'd finally, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of my students uh, who are contributing to the efforts, and also um, and NASA and Qualcomm for sponsoring the research in my group on Embodied AI. And thank you very much for listening. And do you have questions? Mm -hmm. Right, that's a good question. I try to. Okay, first of all, I actually tried a little bit uh, emphasizing the trickiness for transferring between CM and real. Especially, I try to use these examples to tell you. This works. Oh. This works actually suffer from transferring to rail, at least because the skill level transferability is not addressed. And secondly, if you want to have transferable skills, what is the key? To my understanding, build a better simulator is the key. You have to build good physical simulators that faithfully simulate the, if the phenomena in the real world. And also there is one point often ignored by many of the people in the study, which is the role of controllers. Controller is actually has to be thought in a coupled manner as the physical simulation algorithm, which will largely affect the transferability. Now they are actually from the perspective of the physics. There's also the challenge in, term, in terms of the visual transferability. And we mentioned in the part for, for, for you know, like uh, making many skills transferable to real world, there's a part that I actually didn't really emphasize that is about the simulation of the training. Okay, so we have the basic conclusion that RGB images is a lot harder to be transferred from simulated to real world compared with coin cloud. First of all, coin cloud is much easier to transfer. And secondly, even if you want to transfer to coin cloud, it's better in your sensor simulation, you're able to imitate the artifact of real simulation. Like for specular or dark material, real green sensors cannot capture that. Then in a physical the the simulation, it shouldn't make it perfect. One idea is to try to just the face for the simulator. Um, 
how you pick, how you capture the images. And I also want to refer to the recent line research with the NERF. I think NERF might have it, or, or that line research. I could I couldn't call it NERF, NERF, although I feel like I'm calling NERF, probably the best uh, icon for what I'm talking about. Basically, it means neural suit attachment. So for those latest neural suit attachment approach, they are able to capture the real world, the virtual space, in a very good signal. So I think they also have good potential. So, so I, I understand many people are criticizing for simulation technology, like there are things real transfer issue, but I personally feel like this is a challenge that people need to think to address, not to, I don't think there's a way to, to avoid using simulator, in fact, considering fighting a low level state and um, deep or feedback and interacting signal is the time. Okay. Other questions? Okay, that's a great question. Um, now think about this question. Uh, well, again, it's getting even more philosophical. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Um, recently, in the foundation model community. There are a number of very big models, like for example, the PAM model promoted by Google. Okay. And it has actually claimed a very large amount of uh, data from the internet. Now, I would assume that perhaps for certain kind of a model, especially, you know, if it is used of Wikipedia as trained, I think that the PAM's ability as a generalist to understand those rare objects is perhaps better than me. So in terms of being a generalist, to some extent, I think a palm is probably already better than me. Like especially for identifying uh, like the probably like a very rare object. You can see that in a lot of in a very fine way, in a rare object person. I don't know that. But I'm much better in living and adapting to the real world where the work is made. So I somehow feel like uh, we don't really need to pursue, perhaps, in order to have the robots deployable in human states and cooler with humans. We don't really need the palm level generous. Okay. Instead, we perhaps should emphasize more on the common skills for our daily space objects. So I, I would think that having mean, generous is a good idea, but you know, even for generous, there is a spectrum. So for the role uh, case, I would first think about and prioritize the acquiring the scales to manipulate just those common objects. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, well, the ideal case is we are able to create like 1,000 tasks, and each one has like 1,000 object instance, which is the image that scale. But, you know, it's a lot larger efforts. Um, the, 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 uh, I was a member of the image that scale, so I don't know that it's much, much harder. When we're building the internet, so Yan and I, we two people, I think it's that this is the whole internet. Uh, but the here for many still efforts, I think that more than five students collaborated for a few years, and we can scale that we're able to reach for now. So of course, I think that we're able to be faster with better and better knowledge to compute this environment. So when we are trying to build a task for now, we actually try to prioritize that diversity in terms of the scale. Like here, you see the type I list here. Reusable body, artificial body, software body, mode, single arm, dual arm, parallel body, select like the factor. A mobile body is a different manipulation, right? <laughs> so we have 20 classic families, but they are actually very tricky. 
they cover a very good scope of the common schedule. I mean, at least from the control and planning perspective, those kind of challenges um, understood by previous robots of people are well covered by the current legislation. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much for listening because time is also up. Okay. Okay. Yes.